uh, very substantial and largely unobserved or imperceptible because its huge remit covering all aspects of uh, law in our country has developed over decades dealing with matters that are of no real concern or no particular concern to the general public and only of concern to individual litigants. So it's been of immense uh, significance but <coughs> its perceived significance by the more vocal segments of society um, has been that it has made one or two decisions that upset people uh, and those decisions which may actually not be that important have had significant and, arm and arguably unfortunate effects. To take one example, um, whether prisoners should be allowed to vote is quite an interesting point for discussion around the world and conscientious uh, individuals can hold conscientiously different views and I'm sure all people in this country hold different views but the perception that the court uh, has dictated uh, to the government of this country what it should do about prisoners rights has al allowed politicians to use that decision to um, take a position hostile to the court quite unwarranted very unhelpful uh, and I think harmful for the well-being of the country as a whole. So it's a slightly long answer to your question but I think very substantial, usually unperceived and occasionally mischievously misused. Um, <coughs> well I suppose the most obvious not reform but change that was required was to make uh, it speedier in its dealing with cases. To some extent I believe that's been done but that's pretty difficult to achieve if you have a court that is demand-led. Anybody can go to the court. The filters to get them to the court are very limited and therefore if people want to take cases they can and you can't necessarily so easily limit the docket or suddenly in, of the, the overall docket of the court or suddenly increase the capacity of the court to deal with thousands or many thousands more cases. So, but that's a problem that obviously should be confronted if it realistically can within limits that the taxpayers of all the countries involved would be happy to bear. That's probably a lot of nonsense. Um, and it really is critical for those who are led into criticism of the court by uh, manipulative politicians uh, to recall that this court, nothing to do with the, the European Union, was set up after the Second World War by those who had seen uh, or were aware of the extraordinary atrocities committed within Europe by Europeans against Europeans. It was set up by the Council of Europe and interestingly enough as has become a little better known recently, one of its principal draftsmen was an arch-conservative and a conservative who became a Lord Chancellor and uh, uh, against whom real criticism could be levied for some of his right-wing decisions. But it was he who, uh, Viscount Kilmuir he became, who actually drafted many of the provisions. This is not a left-wing creation as some would now probably like to think. It was a cross-party creation of many countries and its concern was to bring basic human rights to all individuals um, so that th there was an additional mechanism to save people from the terrible things that amongst other places had happened in the Second World War. Well, <coughs> what are their proposals? They tend to say one thing today and a different thing tomorrow and there is a substantial I think, number of conservative uh, parliamentarians who would oppose ditching uh, the European Convention of Human Rights uh, applying to our country and would resist our being withdrawn from the European Court. If, perhaps because the Conservative Party suddenly could, could get more votes at the next election by putting this on its manifesto, or thought it could, 
And if it then became a manifesto promise so that it had to be seen through, it is pretty hard to see how what replaced it would be very much different. Because what is enshrined in the European Court of Human Rights has a universality. Obviously, universal rights as declared in the United Nations Convention and then in the European Convention are to some extent creatures of their time. They don't necessarily, coming back, going back to 1948 in the one, 53 or whatever it was in the other, they don't necessarily reflect modern uh, views, at least in writing, on things like sexuality or marriage and family. So that they have a way in which they're slightly dated, but generally speaking, they have a universality that would have to be repeated in any effort that this country made at creating its own uh, document, Bill of Rights or whatever else it might be called. And so it, there wouldn't necessarily be much substantive change, at least in the first place, but the loss to the country would actually be quite substantial, if not very substantial. If you work on the basis that uh, the monopoly of wisdom is unlikely in any discipline to reside in one particular country, it is not the case that all the best surgeons happen to live in Germany or all the best psychiatrists in France. If you wanted to learn the best ways to deal with surgery or the best ways to deal with psychiatry, you would probably say, ah, here's an institution that draws on the learning of all European countries and America and elsewhere, and it is better for having that breadth of input and that breadth of discussion. If you withdraw from the European Convention, you immediately withdraw the input of uh, people from other legal backgrounds who are conscientiously trying to um, identify human rights and the correct response to human rights on really difficult issues like abortion, for example, a, a, a really a topic that is not going to go away and that will remain difficult as medical science uh, advances. Why should we be so silly, vain, pig-headed as to think these issues are best dealt with without the input of what readers of certain newspapers would probably describe as Johnny Foreigner? Dangerous, undesirable and unnecessary. Well, it, it's obviously hard to know what the overall uh, effect of Brexit will be, including the collateral effects and the unintended consequences. But I think it's reasonable to, to imagine that Brexit will encourage uh, the idea of insulation and with that idea, the idea that Britain knows best. And for the reasons I've just given, that might be very unfortunate, uh, certainly for those on the receiving end of, of the law, which pretty much like medicine and other skills is, is in large part a skill, not just political decision making. It is a skill and it's a skill that works to identify real issues that are of general application for man and mankind. And therefore, uh, Brexit is likely to uh, harden the arteries of the thinking of the brain. Do arteries go to the brain? I think they do. To harden the arteries of the body that delivers rights under the law to our people.